Hello, everyone. My name is Zhang Zhang. I can also go by initials ZZ. Uh, I work in IT industry for over 10 years. And during my two years in Bloomberg, uh, I'm actually working on this project that I'm going to present soon. Jenny. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jenny. And have been working with ZZ for around a year on streamlining a mortgage ETL pipeline with Apache Airflow. Before we actually dive into our presentation, I uh, just want to give a brief introduction of what Bloomberg is doing. Um, so basically, Bloomberg is a leading data provider for financial institutions. Uh, we prioritize provides uh, high quality data and also comprehensive data points. Uh, our clients are most likely uh, investors, uh, financial analytics in the bigger form, uh, firms. And uh, what we actually, Jenny and I, my team is doing is to provide mortgage-related data. Yeah, so I just want to give you like a little more context on our product. So who here like has, like who here has a mortgage? Okay, so I guess that most of you guys know like what you guys need to do um, whenever for most people, when they buy a home, they get a, bank, a loan from a bank. And you and, you and this bank will come to some form of agreement on like when, to, when this loan should be paid back in full, how much interest rates owe to them. So this usually takes the form of like a 15 or 30 year mortgage. And you have to pay like X amount once a month. So what does it look like on the bank side? So the bank w once a month receive like hopefully this like constant flow of income until that loan is paid off and the bank has to like keep this, like, keep track of this loan for like 15 or 30 years, like, which is, I guess, a lot of data points to keep track of. Like, and for every loan, there's only like a cumulative, like accumulation of data that we need to keep track of every month. So, banks can also choose to like sell, sell this like cash, cause this like stream of cash flow. This helps them like um, like free up some of their capital so they can help like their next customer like and help them pay for their home. Um, so oftentimes for a lot of residential mortgages, um, I'll th there are three government agencies that will buy up a lot of them, and and like these th three government agencies can also decide to like hold hold these mortgages, or they can also like I guess like create like new securities called like mortgage backed securities based off them, um, which is what, what we do. Uh, we provide data on mortgage-backed securities to our data. Uh, mortgage-backed securities can also can get a little complicated as, like at the bottom layer, um, like you have this like flow, this like flow, flow of cash, cash that goes, this stream of cash flow that goes into, that, that can like make up a single mortgage-backed security. But these, these mortgage-backed securities can also like, uh, I guess redirect their cash flows into other mortgage-backed securities and form this like somewhat tall tree. So the three agencies we talked about before are Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Jenny Mae. Some of you guys may have heard this, and some of you guys may have not. Um, so I guess like what we do is like for, for a lot of mortgages, um, you guys like pay once a month, and these agencies will make their data available twice a month. So and we. It, this occurs on the f this occurs on the fourth and sixth business day of the month. We call these days BD4 and BD6. So during these two days, um, once a month, we will process we will uh, roughly like five billion data points. Um, one thing unique about us is that like we don't have as much clients as we do the num number of data points. Like every cl client we have will like will like do a lot more queries or reads and. We try to provide as much coverage of the mortgage market as possible. Um, another thing we do is provide like aggregations. So in order to help our clients, like I guess, compare securities with each other, we'll group like sec securities that are of similar nature, like similar interest rates or similar um, links, links, and help and like create like some kind of bird's eye view of them. Another thing we do is like we have this dependency tree, as I mentioned before, like these securities can like, I guess, create like a layer on top of each other. And for every mortgage that gets paid, we have to update all their like securities that are impacted. And this has to be done like in order as they are dependent on one another. 
All right, so basically what we do is a data pipeline and we stream that data from the three agencies to our terminal users, our clients. And there are certain characteristics about this ETL pipeline. Uh, first of all, uh, just like Jenny said, uh, we do it twice a month. Uh, but the steps for those two days are quite similar. And the steps are very consistent over the months as well. What we do in previous months, high likely we'll do the, the same thing again. Um, but I have to admit that over the years, that our steps become more and more complicated. That due to uh, increasing pre-processing we need to do, more business requirements, more backup, more SLO. Um, so basically everything, <laughs> that kind of like run it up with like more and more complex things. Um, another characteristic is actually our data is quite messy. And we have to every month manually intervene from time to time. For example, to add a little bit of steps, um, skip a little bit of steps, um, to correct some unwanted, unexpected formats we wanted to. So um, although it's consistent, but every month there are always some kind of like edge cases happening. Another thing is our pipeline is not actually a scheduled or cron job. It's more kind of event-based. Most of the actions are triggered by the event, for example, when the files are published by the three agencies, uh, when they ever wanted to, or some of the, um, our upstream data or like interim data are done processing. And that will basically kick off the rest of the uh, data pipeline. And the last thing, needless to say, <laughs> stability plays a huge part into the whole process. Uh, normally, the agencies will publish the data in Eastern time, maybe like 4 p.m., 8 p.m. And our Asian, uh, Asian markets, um, Europe markets, wants to see the data almost kind of like um, you know, the next day, and for the U.S. customers as well. So we cannot afford any of the services kind of like went down during those two very important agency updates. Um, and here we are talking about the whole ecosystem, like a couple of dozens of microservices and scripts we need to call. Okay, so um, this might come as a surprise to some of you, but before we like, introduce Airflow into our ecosystem, we actually like manually orchestrate it. So what this looked like is that we had like a checklist of things that we need to run and make sure it was okay before we could like sign off and say, oh, the data is all there. So yeah, so some challenges we faced. Um, yeah, it was, we faced a lot of key person risk in that, well not, well, first of all, there needs to be a, a physical human, you know, orchestrating away our data pipeline. And two, it's like it's not very, it's not knowledge that's easily transferable. Um, we also face like some increasing runtime like over the years as we introduce new data points or like product has more um, demands. Like it really just added to the tail end of our ETL process. And other things, there's like I guess a huge lack of observability despite like data being pretty important to all our stakeholders, you really just had to trust that we had, like we did our job. Um, and that's the reason why we were able to like manually orchestrate this is because we, like this pipeline was really only run like twice a month. Um, but with all these challenges, we did decide that we need to like invest in some of our engineering processes and orchestration is definitely one of them. So we are in a desperate need for an orchestration tool. And to be honest with you, we do actually look into like different options we have. Uh, Argo, Dexter, uh, Prefect, Voice, to name a few. And I believe there's a new player in the market right now, it's called like Maestro, provided by Netflix. But eventually, uh, we still ended up choosing the OG of the orchestration community, Apache Airflow, for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, it's implemented by Python, so it's actually quite easy to integrate it with our system. And it does fit all our needs. Uh, for example, we wanted to pause and replace certain tasks, and Airflow can do that. And also, it provides a rich web UI that for us, uh, for visualization. And if something goes down, go wrong, it's easier for us to check the logs. And they also do the security management for us. So basically, one solution for almost all our needs. Um, another reason we choose Airflow is because we actually have a lot of support for this wonderful community uh, we, uh, you know, outside and also within the Bloomberg. Um, you know, when, if we ran into any kind of problem, it's actually very easy for us to Google and highlight if someone already bumped into it 
and that we can just you know take the answer, take the solutions, take the best practice out of it. Um, we also actually in Bloomberg, several teams has been adopt uh, Airflow for quite a few years, and they are giving us very positive feedback as well. Um, so so much so that Airflow actually right now becomes such an important tooling within the Bloomberg that I believe at the first beginning of this year, uh, we had actually engin engineer vote for, um, for donations, for contributions, and eventually I think we made what we call it as like uh, Bloomberg Falls Fund Grant for the Airflow community and in the best hope that this community can nourish and also flourish. All right, so we set up choosing uh, Airflow for our ETL pipeline agency nights. We've been using it for two years, but I would still say that probably there are still some spaces that we can use Airflow a bit better. So maybe after this uh, talk, if you find, okay, there's maybe this thing you can do, different recommendations, suggestions, we'll come to discuss with us. Um, I'm open for it. At the same time, we basically create about 100 tags for just one simple tag. And this number can also tell you actually how many different tags we are doing for the whole ETL system. It actually becomes a living documentation right now for different steps we are doing. And it's kind of like encoding our graph for different steps. For the 100 tasks, uh, it's actually very funny. Yes, most of it I uh, basically batch operators and Python operators, but we do make some customer operators that Jenny will go over on her uh, next slides. Uh, one thing I want to mention is uh, since our DAG are quite repeatable, and since we are trying to ensure the stability of these two nights, we actually do dry runs a lot. Uh, we practice to ensure there's no bug in our system. So we create a lot of reusable task groups and across over a different place. So uh, that will actually reduce the amount of like, coding work we need to do when I try to do the either business four or six or dry run versus real runs. Um, we do have a few custom operators uh, scattered throughout our DAG. Um, like, I guess my, one of them is like the ignore operator. So before like BD4, BD6, we do run do a few dry runs just to make sure everything is working in order. And really the goal of these like dry runs is to like mimic the real run as close as possible with like one very clear exception, update prod data, you don't want to mess with that. Um, so yeah, we actually um, inherited like the dependency mixin class that Airflow has. And like, the way this looks in our code and in our, I guess our GUI is that, oh, if a dry run, just return this ignore operator and it will look like this, otherwise, run this. Um, another thing we have is a message bus operator. So because some parts of our DAG are like event triggered, we need to w wait for like a signal that, oh, like these processes have finished, you can like trigger the next step. Um, it's kind of nice to put it behind an operator and that like we can like easily switch out the back end. We currently use uh, Apache Kafka to, to like communicate between events. Another thing we have is the alert operator. So um, one thing that's very important to us is to like make sure like our stakeholders are aware of what, what's going on without like actively monitoring the DAG. So we do connect our DAG with like some internal messaging and log systems and they'll just blast, oh, like the DAG is running, we have processed some files, oh, th the night has finished successfully. Okay, I'm gonna briefly talk about our setup. Um, we actually have two ways of setup. Uh, for our dev environments, uh, we are using the local executor and the SQLite. Uh, the reason we're doing that is actually allow the author of the DAX can prototype their workflow quite independently without interfering with each other. It's kind of like working in the sandbox environments. And once the workflow is approved, or should I say like a PR is merged, uh, we deploy that workflow to production. And for production, we actually use the salary executor uh, coupled with the Postgres and RabbitMQ as the uh, message queue to distribute the task. Uh, we also uh, uh, distribute our workers over four different data centers. We did that not because we actually have tons of like parallel tasks that needs that much of worker. Uh, we did that is majorly for the redundancy reasons. And I believe actually for one or two times over the two years that one or two data centers 
went down, uh, but Airflow can still hold up and uh, keep on running for the different tasks, which is awesome for us, uh, ensure the stable stability for us. Uh, I would say that actually my favorite page for the official website uh, for the Airflow, that would be the architecture diagram page. Um, I check in like from a you know, couple of months, uh, uh, you know, I kind of like to see what is the recommended way, the best practice way to uh, deploy Airflow. And we actually went through the same process as like, at first we think everybody just be uh, Airflow users, you know, everyone is in. But eventually, when the project evolved, uh, we started to find out we actually have more defined roles. Uh, for example, like DAC authors and deploy managers and operation, uh, operational uh, users as well. So um, actually, I do like the different uh, kind of recommendations of deployments that provided by uh, the official website um, that allow us to do the deployment differently, that allow the different users can collaborate very well with a clear definition of their roles. So yeah, since we started on this journey of like, you know, improving some of our work workflow, uh, we have decreased our average runtime by like 51%, which is pretty incredible. Um, and like we have resolved a lot of the earlier problems we mentioned before. Like obviously no one's like manually orchestrating this. We have passed this job along to Airflow. There's not a lot of key person, well, there's still always key person risk with like domain knowledge and everything, but all this is encoded in some kind of DAG that's, um, I guess, supposed to be a lot more, uh, it's, it's supposed to make it a lot more like readable and transparent. Uh, as I showed you on the previous slide, we have like decreased our runtime a lot. I think if you like look into like how our DAG like looks throughout, like from when we first started to when we last started, it makes it a lot more clear, I guess, to us, like what processes we were able to get rid of. And like the bottlenecks, bottlenecks that we were able to reduce. And obviously it was like the rich Airflow, Airflow UI. It was really easy for like anyone to like just go on our website and click on any task and check, oh, what's currently running, what has run, and even go into the logs and check, oh, like this actually ran. Yeah. Thank you.